morning, Scottsville. I wanted to uh, get a special message out this morning. I know it's been kind of difficult with the, with the quarantines and the different things, and I have to apologize because we had no idea at the time when we went to see my granddaughter that she was positive. And so, unfortunately, we're working from uh, from home today. But uh, hopefully the, the elders were working on some things to try to get the church to not have to worry about this uh, if it happens again. Uh, we're really struggling to make sure that everybody is safe. Uh, we want to be as, as clean and, and safe as possible. Uh, we don't want anybody to take a chance on, on getting uh, any kind of COVID or or anything for that matter. But I do want to remind everybody that this is uh, a temporary thing. You know, God's in control and we're gonna give that over to Him and, and let God be the one that's gonna uh, take this and, and walk with it. But our responsibilities as leaders in the church are to you guys and, and your health but we also have a strong sense of responsibility towards your faith. And I think that's where we need to be setting our, our goal today. Uh, we are in Bible Book of the Month, 1 Thessalonians. If you'd like to uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians and uh, maybe even just to let you know you're going to be in Acts chapter 2 uh, a little bit here. But first of all, we're going to kind of talk from 1 Thessalonians. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you, we lift you up, Lord, and, and we want to always be in your will in everything that we do. I struggle with doing these online uh, Sundays because I know that people are, are struggling. They need their fellowship and they need their time uh, together in worship. It's the reason why you gave us the koinonia and fellowship, Lord, that we would have these times to come together and encourage and build each other up. So, Lord, we need you to, to just guide us and lift our leadership up that we might feel safe and making sure that people are here and, and healthy and uh, that they're spiritually being fed properly. Uh, I think that's the number one thing. Praise God, we've not had but a couple of cases that were not in the severe range yet as far as uh, COVID goes and things have been a little bit more uh, of a blessing here with our folks but God this whole nation is being turned upside down for a virus that is 99.99% uh, just a, a flu and I struggle with the idea that we're not in your worship and I want to be there in your presence always Lord and we want to as a, a group of fellowship of believers and royal priests we want to be in your presence Lord so we're asking that you would guide this church that you would lift us up you are the leader Lord you are the head of this church and we're asking you to be the one to lead us and to bring us to a place that we're supposed to be. We have folks that are, are waiting to come here, Lord, and, and they need to know that we're safe and that we're doing things the right way. We ask these things and ask for your guidance in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Thank you. Uh, Wanted to uh, give a quote or a, a, an old uh, preacher thing. It says, let me see if you've heard this said before. If you ever find the perfect church, please do not go there because it won't be anymore. <laughs> oh my, that's kind of an arrogant statement, isn't it? But is it true? The truth is, if the local churches are made up of human beings that are saved by God's grace, 
then no church is ever going to be the perfect church. And we won't get there until we see the Lord's face. The church at Thessalonica was in that category. Okay? Uh, at least four times in this letter, Paul gave thanks for the church and the way that they had responded to his ministry. In verse uh, 1, 2, 2, 13, 3, 9, and 5, 18, he does this all four times. But not many preachers can be that thankful for the way that Paul was to this church. See, these letters were written because there were issues in the church. Some were to encourage and build up, but some were to, um, to lead them in a way of holiness. And uh, I think that's very important for us. Uh, my friend and I were talking the other day, and he said, you know, I, I hate to have people look at me and have that impression that I'm trying to be holier than thou. We should never, ever think that way. That should never be a concern because God says that we are to be holy as God is holy. And we can't meet that challenge, but we as Christians can never be holier than anyone. But we want to strive to holiness. That is our job as royal and holy priests, to be holy as God is holy. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 with me. We're just going to read through the chapter real quick. Uh, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to the church. We'll remember that because it's going to come back to that. To the church of Thessalonians in God, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and favor of love and steadfastness of hope. In our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, this, His choice of you for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you can become, get this, an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has, shown, has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception that we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, and whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. What characteristics of this church made it so much of a model to the church and to all the believers? These characteristics, Paul says, working faith, labors of love, and steadfastness of hope. The Christian church, I believe, is my proposition this morning is very simple. The Christian church should strive to be a Christ-centered first century New Testament church. That's our obligation 
to the world and to the kingdom of God. We're called to be Christ-centered first. As we study chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, we will find some biblical truths that we're going to guide with our congregation as we go. These biblical truths are what we're going to look at toward being just that a Christ-centered first century New Testament church. Because we're part of the restoration movement. We want to restore the new, the first century New Testament church. This is where we as a church want to be. Um, real quick, I want to go back. This first truth that we're going to look at should realize that we are a called out people. We are a called out people. Uh, first, verse 1, <clears throat> uh, Paul and uh, Sylvanus and Timothy to the church, the ecclesia. It is the called out ones. It's the a called out people. Whenever we read about a calling in the Bible, it indicates a divine election. God is calling out a people from this world to his work. Okay? So this is important for us to understand. The church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. He's talking to us, church. This is us. Paul tells this congregation that their work is produced by faith. It's a work of faith and a labor of love. That's the second thing. And finally, the third thing are their endurance or their steadfastness. And that's, a, that's something we need to really struggle with in our own church. Our endurance and our steadfastness is inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's where we're we're called in the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, the word Paul uses for hope in the Bible is one that is one of my favorite Greek words. And I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar by any means, but I have done a little bit of Greek work and a little study. And, and our language doesn't really capture the meaning of hope that Paul is using here. See, we have reduced the word to uh, more like a wish. You know, <laughs> we're a wish upon a star like Pinocchio's dad. That's our hope. Well, I hope one day that you become a boy, a real boy, right? I hope that one day I'm going to get a house. I hope one day I hit the lottery. I hope one day I can have a new truck. I hope one day I might get a job that's going to pay enough that I could live like a king. Hope. I hope that Santa Claus comes to my house at Christmas. I hope. I hope. I hope. That's not what Paul is, is talking about here. See, Paul's intent here is very clear. His meaning of hope, this word that we're going to talk about is a done deal. It has already happened. It's a guarantee to the church. He tells them to have hope in Jesus. Elpis, the desire of something good with the expectation of obtaining it. It is an ex. You know you're going to get it because it's a done deal. To expect with the desire, with a trust, a confidence to have security in. See, that's what hope was to those in the first century church. I struggle with what I see from the church. 
See, I think we've lost hope. There's things that, that I see happening in the Lord's church, not here so much, but all over that I really have a problem with. You know, we have the devil trying to stop us from worshiping. Here, we're fighting it. You know, we're, we're doing online stuff and, you know, we're trying to go out and, and see people best we can with, you know, the things that we need to serve. You know, we were there with Joanne. You know, a lot, the whole church just wrapped themselves around Joanne this last week as Ronnie was sent home. I pray that, that this church always remains one of hope and knowing that God is a done deal. That what He has guaranteed us, what He has encouraged us, what He has promised us is always going to be there and it's always going to be real. If I hope, then I believe that it's a done deal. See, it's like having faith in the Lord Jesus as my Savior. My hope is in Christ Jesus. Period. There is no other hope. Those who are outside Christ have no hope. Though song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. His promises are my hope. Verse 3, he says that we are constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labors of love, and your steadfastness of hope, knowing that you have belief in Christ and that it's a done deal. It's real and it's tangible and it's just as physical as this table and this Word of God. It is hope. It's a guarantee. Are you one who hopes in Christ? I hope so. <laughs> Right? I pray it. It's my desire to want you to have hope and faith and trust and steadfastness that endures in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Apostle Peter called the Christian a member of a royal and holy priesthood. Paul claims that we are a called out people. The Ecclesia. Right? We're called out by God to serve and do the work of the church. For the church to begin to act like that, we are to be a called out people. We need to act like it. Faith in Jesus, knowing that God has got our back, He is the one that we can trust. Sometimes I lack in that, and I, I'm, I have to apologize because I struggle there. I know I have all the faith in the world, but then fear, pain, heartache, life, and the world tries to step in and stop that hope. And sometimes... It takes me a minute to get back to where I'm, okay, I'm not going to believe what the world is telling me. My hope is in Jesus. My faith is in Him and I know I can trust Him to do what's right. He will always have my back. My hope my, is a done deal. And I need to remember that because I struggle with that sometimes. Because life steps in. 
Our second truth is that the Christians should be imitators of the early church, the apostles, and the Lord. Those three things. Now, the early church was a group of sinners. <laughs> they, they were bad. They were not right. But they knew what the apostles were teaching. The apostles struggled. Peter struggled. He wasn't right. But yet, he was our example. But our real example, our true example, is in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5 and 6. It says, uh, For our gospel, talking about Jesus' life, burial, resurrection, and that he's coming again. That's the gospel. Did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. What kind of men we prove to be. Remember that quote, if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you're going to mess it up. <laughs> right? God is expecting us to be perfect. Right? No. He doesn't expect perfection. He wants us to strive for perfection. It's said that we will be complete and lacking in nothing if we are doing things the way God has laid it out. We become mature. That word perfect in the, in the Greek is a maturity. It's not perfection as in Christ. We can never meet perfection in Christ. Never. It's just not going to happen. But what we can do is work harder every single day to be a better Christian than we were the day before. That's pretty simple. And if we do that and we strive each day to be better than we were yesterday, we're going to mature. That's what God wants. See, the church here is a building. But here is the church. The building is a hospital for sinners. It's where we go to get well when we're sick and when we struggle and when we're sinning. We go there to get built up and be brought out of our sickness. That's the building. We are the church. We have it backwards in our modern American mentality. We think that the building is the church. This is not. You and I, we are the church. We can't forget that. We are to be the examples, to be imitators of that early church, that early group of apostles that were the teachers that God left in charge and to most generally be the imitators of Christ. We, we hear the, the rigor roar about Black Lives Matter, the BLM. I say it's the GLM. Gentile lives matter. This is what Paul was talking about. They were to correct the wrong being done in the churches. That's why we have these, these epistles written down for us. There were things that were messed up in the churches and all these letters were written to correct problems. Okay? Our goal is to do the things that's in here to lead us. The apostles gave us solid teaching and wisdom that came from the Holy Spirit. It is the God-breed Word of God. It is without error. All of this is laid out for us so that we would know what to do 2,000 years later. It has been carried by the Holy Spirit and protected by God. And all we have that we can trust is this Word. That's it. The Apostle Peter, what if I said that he was a racist pig because he ate with Gentiles and never really wanted them to be in the church. We got Black Lives Matter because if they say that everybody's racist, you know, for this or that, 
I say the Gentile lives matter because Peter was an absolute racist. Paul called him out for it. Peter was doing things he was not supposed to be doing. He would go out and he would eat with Gentiles and, and minister to them, but when it came time to be around Jewish people, he would say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're just, you know, people that I've been talking to, but I, I'm really with you guys instead. I won't eat with a, a Gentile, right? God called him out. Because Peter was not doing the things he was called to be doing. He wasn't being the church. I'm going to flip the script. So let's all model the apostles in the New Testament church. Well, I take issue with that. Why? Because they're just basic examples. We can model them all we want. But what we really need to be doing is putting our faith in Jesus who is the ultimate example. Yeah, I've been playing it a little bit as I go through. Jesus is the true example, and this I can agree on. Fact is, folks, if we act human, then we're actually going to be stuck up hypocrites. We're darned if we do and darned if we don't. But if we act like Jesus, <laughs> get this, then you're an absolute hypocrite. Because you're out here partying and living life to its abundance. As Jesus did. As he enjoyed life and, and encouraged people and lifted people up. And he did everything. He would go out and, and hang out with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. And he would have dinners with them and drink wine. And, and there was actually a, a word he called himself. He said the, the son of man is called a drunkard. Which was an actual word for beer drinker. It's a possibility Jesus may have even been a beer drinker. That's crazy. Right? Well, we act like Jesus, then, well, you ain't no better than anybody else. No. Nope. We're not. We're called out to act like Jesus. Well, Jesus went out into the highways and the byways and he went into the alleyways. And he lifted people up out of their sin. And out of their shame. And he loved them. And I think that's where the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be enjoying life more abundant. Instead of worrying about being teetotalers all the time. Yeah, we need to be careful and not be drunkards and not do those things. But we can be human and enjoy what it is that God has laid out for us in this world without being hypocrites. Man, you want to act like Jesus? You want to really offend people? Tell them you're a Christian when you're sitting at the barbecue with a glass of wine. You're a Christian. Oh my. At what point are we anything less than a house or a hospital for sinners? See, that's what God's called us to be. You know, we want to help people. We want to encourage them. In the beginning, the church had established a unique identity. And that's what it is that God's called us to be living by. That unique identity to separate ourselves from the world in a way that we worship. We separated ourselves then from Judaism in the way that they worship. Our example is in Acts chapter 2. So turn back there if you would. Acts chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 29. It says, Brother, I may confidently say to you that regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had swore to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. And he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did he his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, 
God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, there's 120 of them probably there. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this in which you both see and hear those crazy things that were going on. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, being Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus in whom you crucified. He's talk, they're talking to the men who just 50 days prior to that had led Jesus to the cross and yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Now when they heard this, the men, the Jews, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And here's what Peter, the man who was given the keys to the kingdom, in the Gospel of Matthew, we, we have that oh, around 15, 16. Jesus said, you are going to give him the keys and anything you establish will be bound in heaven. Anything you loose will be loosed. Okay, get this. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to Himself, that will be us. Okay? And with many other words, He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word were... <laughs> hey, folks. <laughs> I started doing the uh, the video and something went wrong right about here. So I had to come back and redo the rest of the sermon. But we were in the process of reading from Acts chapter 2. Don't know what's going on, but well, I tell you, there's something going on because the devil does not want this sermon to get out there. There's something crazy going on here. Let me see where we were. Do, do, do. Let's start with verse 34 of Acts chapter 2. For it was not David who assumed it, uh, who ascended into heaven, but he himself the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus in whom you crucified. This is right about where we were. It says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 39 goes on to talk about what happened. For the promise is for you and your children, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. That would be us. And with many other words and solemnly testified to keep on exhorting them, saying, We uh, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and given the gift of the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sin, right? And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. This is the basics of what it is that we do in the church. 
The beginning of the church had some very distinct traditions. They believed that Jesus was the Christ. They followed this plan of salvation. Hear the word, believe the word, confess Jesus as Lord, repent, and be baptized, and then live the life. All were baptized by immersion. 3,000 souls. And they came together in basic services to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the Word of God. That's what we consider the apostles' teaching, the Word of God, the Bible, as we know it, the 66 books. We don't need any extra. They had a fellowship, a koinonia. Uh, it means fellowship, communion, a society, almsgiving, and communication distribution. So koinonia is what we do in the church. We come together, we give, we take communion, we, we break the bread, right? And we come together and pray for each other. This is a part of what we do. That We give an offering. We give communication about what's going on. Uh, we have you know, several things that, that are going on with the center shot starting on last week of August, uh, all the way up into October, except for when we have revival on the 13th. All these things are very important to our koinonia, our fellowship. We have meals together. They prayed together as a church. In our congregation here at Scottsville, that's what we do. You know, we try to be very close to what it is that God says here. We sing praises to God. We pray for those that we know and we love. We study God's word that's given by the apostles and the apostles' teaching. We give alms. We give our... our uh, ties to the church or our offerings to the church, we take communion and we have time for announcements in the end where we give communication to one another. You know, we have a lot of fellowship meals. You can see you got a fat preacher, you got to have good fellowship meals, right? It's important. But I think that we meet Paul's example of a loving church as in our Quinonia our fellowship here. Third truth is that we are to be models to all the believers that we should let our faith be known everywhere. Reading uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 here. Go back with me if you would. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. Seven here. So that you become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we may have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception that we have with you and how to turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Public displays of faith. You know, it doesn't need to be about some kind of elaborate display like God. You know, a guy standing in the street corner screaming, Jesus is coming, get ready. And, you know, the end is coming. And we, we don't have to be elaborate in those things. But it can be as simple as telling somebody about your congregation and your fellowship, your koinonia here at Scottsville Christian Church. And I think we lack there. You know, we don't have the visitors that we need because we lack in going out and having people inviting people to church. You know, to see this wonderful service that we have and this wonderful fellowship or koinonia that we have here at Scottsville Christian. This is one of the, the most loving, caring churches I have ever been around. And, and I, I just, I struggle with why people don't want to invite people to be a part of that. Paul gives us something to think about here in the opening chapter. Uh, actually, in last verse is not, is not the final verse by any means, but it's the final one for this chapter in verse 10. It says that we are to wait for his son from heaven and whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. You know, it, it, we are to sit and wait, be patient, waiting for Jesus. Revelation says 
in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 10, that we're to be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. Church, we are to never give up, never surrender, because the hope of an everlasting life is within our grasp. It's there. It's just right past this camera. That hope is a done deal. It's guaranteed by Jesus if we have the faith to live life according to His will. He has called us out. We are the ecclesia, the ecclesiastic, the church. We are the called out ones. Remember that the church of Christ, the Christian church, should be striving to be the Christ-centered, New Testament church. And as we as Christians should be striving to be Christ-centered people. And let Him be our example. Let Him be the one that leads us and calls us into situations that we need to be called into. God has called us out. We need to realize that we are called out people of a royal and holy priesthood. The priests are the ones who did the work of the church, the work of the temple and the tabernacle. Those are the ones who came together and were the servants of God. And each and every one of us who are baptized believers are called out in the Lord's church. We should be working hard to follow a biblical example in everything that we do, not just here on Sunday mornings, but every time that we wake up, we give praise to God He gave us a new day to serve Him. God has called us out. We should be patient and faithful till the end that we are as Christians, we can be hopeful and have full understanding of what that word hope for the future means. It's a done deal. God has given us His Word. I trust that this is the full Word of God. There is no other. It is the inerrant, without error. If there's a problem in the Bible, it's because of my interpretation. It's not because the Word of God has been corrupted. It is without error. Translations may have some differences. But the Word is true. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we give you praise. We give you glory. We ask that you would just lift up this congregation, Lord. That you would pull us together as a family, as a, a quinonia, Lord, that we might have hope in you and knowing that you have blessed us, that you have given us all your word that we need. We have all that we need to be able to be surviving in this world that we're just called to be aliens in for a short time. God, we trust you. We believe in you. Keep us together as a family, Lord. Call those who are struggling to seek you out and know that you are God and you are the head of this church, Lord. It's in your holy name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.